I'm the Gypsy, and you're not, and this is the Rubber Biscuit Road Show, presented by Artist Alley Studio, featuring the artisan, handcrafted, and branded creations of the Gypsy and Mad Hatter at www.artistalleystudio.com. And now, on with the show. Season 2, Episode 21 of the Rubber Biscuit Road Show. I am your host, The Gypsy. Now, before we go on with the podcast today, I do need to apologize to you. You may hear some dogs barking in the background. That is because it is a really nice day out, and I am sitting in my breezeway recording today's podcast. Across from us, uh, actually on the other side of our fence line, our neighbor has about seven or eight dogs over there. And our neighbor is extremely rude, and she uh, she refuses to you know train her dogs not to bark constantly. So you may hear them in the background. If you do, you definitely have my apologies. If you were with us last time, you will recall that I finished up my uh, novel "Never Say Never: An Epic Journey" about my mother Shirley Elizabeth Hummel, who suffered from mental illness her entire life. And we will do Volume 2 sometime in the future, but for now, you know, that's where we left it. Today's episode, I have kind of entitled, We Versus I. We Versus I is at times as different as Night Versus Day. But in some instances, We Versus I makes no difference whatsoever, and the gap between them is extremely small. When my mother was growing up. She was always looking for acceptance. She wanted to be recognized. She wanted to be accepted. She continued that quest her entire life. She never felt that she had a worthiness. She never felt that people really looked at her and thought she was worth anything. Things that happened in her life didn't help her any get past that point. One of those things was when she grew up in the Nazarene Church. She was an actual card-carrying member of the Nazarene Church, but she did a horrendous thing that caused them to revoke her membership. She became pregnant with me. She became pregnant out of wedlock. Heaven forbid that happened, and they literally pulled her membership. However, they were generous enough to say, you know what, you can still come to church, just don't consider yourself a full-fledged member. The we had made a decision for the I, what was morally correct and what was morally right, and the we had decided that the I was not as important as the we. So therefore, my mom was ostracized. This happened time and time again during her life. To me, I don't see where it made a difference. If she believed in God, if she was saved, if she enjoyed going to church, why would they need to pull her membership? Now, on the same hand, why do you need a membership to go to a church anyway? Things that had happened in the Nazarene Church when I was growing up kind of soured me on organized religion for years and years and years. As a matter of fact, for the majority of my life. It's just been within the past couple of years that I renewed my faith. I go to Topeka Bible Church now, and they are a very, very welcoming church. And they don't care whether you have a card that says you're a member of the church or not, what they care about is that you believe in God, you believe Jesus Christ is your Savior, and that you come to church and learn and grow and love, love one another. Isn't that what it's all about anyway? The we at Topeka Bible Church is just as important as the I, and the I is just as important as we. I wish my mother could have found that type 
of acceptance during her life. Maybe some of her mental issues would have been, if not altogether eradicated, at least lessened a little bit, but unfortunately it never happened for her. Recently, there was a story on the news about how some Catholic priest, when doing a baptism, instead of using the word, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, said, we baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. And now the Catholic Church has decided that all those baptisms, those thousands of baptisms that these priests did, are no longer valid. Why aren't they valid? Am I missing something here? Does it make a difference if we say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ, or we baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ? According to the Catholic Church, when you say, I, you're channeling Jesus Christ, and he speaks through you. Okay, but by the same token, if you say we, wouldn't you still be channeling Jesus Christ? Won't he still be working through you? Because after all, isn't Jesus three different entities? Isn't he the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Isn't that a we and not an I? See, I totally don't understand what difference it makes whether it's I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit or we baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. It makes absolutely no sense because I don't think on Judgment Day, when you're standing before the gates of heaven, that St. Peter is going to look through his book and say, oh, I'm sorry, you cannot enter heaven. Yes, yes, yes. And I know you're saved, and I know you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior, and I know that you love and believe in God and the Holy Spirit. But because your priest said we and did not say I, you just cannot enter the gates of heaven. You are unpure. I honestly do not think that is going to happen. God wants us to come to him just as we are. Baptism is a great thing. Baptism is a commitment. It is a commitment that you have dedicated yourself to God. Most of the people that were baptized in the Catholic Church were baptized as children, as babies. Babies come into this world bearing the sins of their father, so the Bible says, but I also believe that babies come into this world innocent. And babies really have no say over whether they're going to commit themselves to God. That comes later on when they have thought, when they have feeling, and when they are ready to do so. So the fact that a priest baptized a baby and said we instead of I is a total and complete waste of space and energy on the part of the Catholic Church to say, oh, all these thousands of people need to be rebaptized. It's just, it's ridiculous. And it's just like the same thing that happened with my mother. You had a church organization saying, oh, I'm sorry, because you got pregnant out of wedlock. You're just not worthy anymore. The we versus the I. Very powerful thing when used against an individual, don't you think? I had another instance with a we versus an I recently. It turns out that the Kansas City Police Department was going to hold a training session to where gypsies, my people, the Romani, and Yugoslavians, and Romanian nationals, and uh, travelers, and Roma, they were all going to be identified in the seminar as the criminals that they are. It listed things like uh, scrappers, uh, fortune tellers. Oh, man, the list just went on and on and on. The only thing I really didn't see in there was candy makers, but, you know, I'm pretty sure that they would have delved into the candy maker part of it because, after all, you know how evil candy makers are. Look how fat they make us, right? Anyway, I and other Romani people had a fit. We came unglued because they had just basically, Kansas City Police Department had just said that we were all criminals. Now, when I contacted the Kansas City Police Department about this, and I found out later I wasn't the only one that did, come to find out that they tried to justify the training as saying that it was being given by a separate group. But if you looked at their advertising for this training, Kansas City Police Department not only endorsed the training, but they sponsored it. Now, 
if they claim otherwise, they better go back and look at those advertisements because those advertisements really show what the truth is. And it showed that KCPD was sponsoring and endorsing a ethnic uh, seminar taking an ethnic group, the Gypsies, and stating that they were criminals and this is how you can spot a Gypsy criminal. Now, I can help them out here. I mean, if you want to spot a Gypsy criminal, it's really easy to do. Uh, they're going to go out and they're going to steal your babies. Uh, they're going to dance around campfires and hope you throw money at them. And while, they're throwing, while you're throwing money at the pretty Gypsy dancer, uh, the men are going to sneak up behind you and they're going to pick your pocket. Then they're going to tell your fortune. Why they're telling your fortune, again, the children that they have stolen will sneak up behind you and they'll pick your pocket. See, I just solved the whole thing, and I did it in, what, less than a minute? So they really didn't need the seminar. <laughs> what I just said is just as ridiculous as the seminar that they were going to have. This seminar, this, uh, to, you know, get the KCPD familiar with the criminal element of the gypsies was so horrendous that I contacted the Department of Justice and I sent them information on it and I put it underneath the civil rights violation because that is exactly what it was. And what's funny is that is not the only civil rights violation that I've had to bring to the attention of the Department of Justice recently. Back here, oh, I guess it's been about a month ago, I was looking up some information to post on our Facebook group of Romani Gypsy Soul. It's a group for gypsies. Uh, to meet and talk and, you know, get to know each other. And I came across this uh, reference material about gypsies. And basically it said that we were illiterate, unclean, that all of us were criminals, uh, that we smelled bad, that we dressed funny, and that we never brushed our teeth. You get the idea. It didn't actually say that, but it might as well have. And guess where that reference article was at? It was on the Department of Justice's reference library. That's right. The Department of Justice had a reference article to identify what gypsies wore so that law enforcement officials would be well informed. Well, I contacted the Department of Justice and basically I said, what the hell? And I said, I cannot believe cannot believe that you would have such a racist reference article on your website. Now, this article was posted in 1980. Makes no difference. Whoever their librarian is for this reference library should be looking at articles every once in a while and, you know, updating them. It'd be a really good idea rather than just leaving it floating out there since 1980. It referenced a book and uh, How to Know Gypsies or some stupid title like that really cheap little paperback book. Anyway, I contacted them about it, kind of raised a little hell over it, and I received an email from the Department of Justice, and of course it had all the legal jargon in it about how, you know, this is a reference source and it can be found all over the internet and in libraries and blah, 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 blah. But yes, they agree with me, and it is racist, and we will be removing it from our reference library, which they did. See, I strongly believe that sometimes when the I goes to the we and speaks loud enough, that the we has to pay attention. They can't ignore it. I mean, let's look at Black Lives Matter. Let's look at all the horrendous things that law enforcement and that rednecks have done to our black citizens, to our citizens, to not just black citizens, but people of color, whether they be Hispanic, whether they be black, whether they be Native American whether they be Asian, okay? If you have color, you're a target. And the we goes all after the I, okay? And sometimes the we gets put in check over going after the I, and we've seen that a lot recently. Now, one place where we didn't see it was that nice little cop that decided that she was going to go ahead and shoot the boy in the car after she yelled, taser, 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 and she grabbed her block and pumped around into it. Really? That big yellow taser on your hip looks exactly like that block. 
And then the judge crying and feeling sympathy for this poor officer that had to endure the pain of killing this boy gave her less than two years. So that's all that's all a man's life is worth, less than two years. This fine officer that bumped around into that nice young man that, yeah, made a mistake, but didn't deserve to have a round pumped into him. He don't have a life. He don't even have two years now. He has nothing. Meanwhile, she only has served two years and she has the rest of her life. This is a case where the we totally ignored the I and said, basically spit in the I's face and said, we don't care. We don't care that this young man died. Feel sorry for the officer that killed him. I don't feel sorry for her. And whatever she gets while she's in prison, I fully feel like she deserves it. Problem is, unfortunately, is that in our world, the we versus the I is more times than not more powerful than the I. That does not mean, however, that the I cannot stand up and fight back. That the I cannot say, this is wrong. For when the I says this is wrong, other voices chime in. When this I said, this is wrong, he got his information on what the KCPD, the Kansas City Police Department, was doing from another gypsy who had posted the advertisement for that training seminar about identifying gypsy criminals. So now I have that information, and I write to the KCPD, Raising Cane. The other gypsy, her name's Alicia, she took and she wrote to him, Raising Cane. Then others joined in. A lot of people, a lot of Romani, uh, attacked the KCPD for hosting the seminar, and the Kansas City Police Department canceled the seminar. So in this case, the I became the we, and the we took the lesser we, which was the Kansas City Police Department, and said, no, we don't think this is going to happen. And we ended up prevailing. You know, you may think that yourself as an I, you have no power, but I guarantee you, just like a prophet crying out in the wilderness, if you yell loud enough, someone's going to hear you. And they're going to come along and say, what's going on? And when you tell them, they're going to say, how can I help? And then they're going to cry along with you. And they're going to, it's going to be louder and more people are going to hear. And they're going to come and they're going to say, what can I do to help? And before long, you're no longer an I, you're a we. And you're a very powerful we. So don't think just because you're an I that you have no power. Because you have more power than you think. My mom had more power than she thought. She thought that she was just an I and that she didn't matter. When the truth is, she mattered more than she even knew herself. So never be afraid to say something when you see a wrong. Never be afraid to write a wrong. And never, ever ignore a wrong. Ignoring something that's wrong, that's probably the worst thing in the world that you can possibly do. Now, before we call it a day here, I just want to go back to the Catholic Church and the we versus the I, you know what? I was baptized once. As a matter of fact, well, I was christened, but I was also baptized. The guy that baptized me was a guy by the name of the Reverend Biker Mike. The Reverend Biker Mike was a former outlaw biker who had almost died when his motorcycle uh, hit the back of a gas tanker truck. The truck exposed exploded and somehow biker mike survived he dedicated his life to god he uh he was later murdered by his wife but that's a different story for a different day but the reverend biker mike had a church called gathering place and he baptized me and a whole bunch of other people that went to the gathering place in a creek called show creek over missouri when biker mike baptized me as he dunked me under I still remember what he said. We baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he dunked me under. And then when he pulled me up, he said, I think he needs two dunks, don't you, Lord? And he dunked me again. <laughs> now, I don't know whether two dunks, you know, ensures my place in heaven. 
But there's one thing that I do know. Just because Mike or Mike said we instead of I does not keep me out of heaven. And the Catholic Church would be wise to learn that lesson. We in place of I does not keep people out of heaven, especially people that had no say as to whether they wanted to dedicate their life to God or not at the time that they were baptized. I think that it's up to each individual to decide if they want to turn to Jesus Christ as their Savior, dedicate their life to God, and do the good works that God wants us to do to not only make this place, this our earth a better place, our world a better place, but to also ensure our spot in heaven next to him. Well, that's it for this episode of the Rubber Biscuit Road Show. Please tune in next time when I don't know what the subject matter will be, but I guess we'll find out. I'll come up with something, I promise. But before I sign off, I've got one small favor to ask of you. My wife recently, um, they diagnosed her with breast cancer. And she's going through a very hard time, needless to say. I am going to ask you as an I to say a prayer for her. Say a prayer not only for her healing, but also for her emotional and mental well-being. And you as an I, if you join with other eyes that are hearing this podcast today, and pray for my wife that she is healed and that she gets through this emotionally, mentally, and uh, physically, then as you join with other eyes to pray for her health and her well-being, then you will turn into a we, and the we will be a lot more powerful than just the I. I would deeply appreciate you to do that from the bottom of my heart. So until next time, this is your friendly neighborhood gypsy saying, please remember my wife Rachel in your prayers. May God bless and keep you in yours. Later, Gators. Bye-bye now. Visit the Rubber Biscuit Road Show online at www.rubberbiscuit.com. That's www.r-u-b-b-e-r-b-i-s-k-i-t.com. The Rubber Biscuit Road Show is produced by Tatman Productions, LLC. All parts of this program are copyrighted, all rights reserved. No parts may be published, reproduced, or used without the written express permission of Tatman Productions, LLC.